Welcome to the Multego podcast. It's our very first episode. Um, joining us today is Dr. Katie Paxton Fear. Also, uh, with us is Mario from, from the Multego team um, and myself. Uh, my name is Brad. I'm the global key account manager with Multego. Um, so, Mario, maybe you can introduce yourself and uh, we'll move over to our guest. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot of fun questions. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I work uh, with Multego. I, uh, I am an SME with Multego. So, what that means is that uh, I help creating content and I help investigating and doing research for the cybersecurity um, um, side of things, if you can say. That's why I'm so uh, happy and so thrilled to be um, to have Katie here with us. I know that Katie, you, you say that you you didn't go directly into cybersecurity, and we'll go, I think, into that uh, in in a few minutes. But I think your uh, what you have to say it's really interesting. It's all it's so. Um, important for people to hear it so i'm not i'm not going to steal too much of your time i think that we should actually go in talk with katie which is actually the, the really exciting and fun part of the podcast yeah absolutely thanks mario so yeah i mean look uh, we, we do have a lot to learn from uh, the likes of katie um she's got an impressive background um uh, lecturer of the cyber security uh lecturer of cyber security at the manchester metropolitan university uh technical community manager at bug crowd um, a seasoned hacker, 30 plus vulnerabilities on your name, um, starting all the way back in 2019. Katie, welcome. Uh, tell us a bit about, bit about yourself. Um, what excites you about this? Uh, thank you. So yeah, like you said, I, I've got, I started in 2019. I originally got into security kind of by accident. Um, I didn't really intend to go into security. Uh, I have a degree in computer science, and after I finished my degree, I went and worked at a company doing data science and development, and it was a good job. Like, it was funny. It was challenging. I was walking to lunch one day, and I realized I wasn't being very fulfilled, so I quit, um, and I decided I wanted to go and do a PhD. Unfortunately, this was in around Christmas time. And the PhDs had already closed. So I only really had one option and that was cybersecurity mixed with what I already knew, which is like natural language processing, data science stuff. And I was like, well, I hate my job that much, may as well. Um, so I didn't really ever intend to get into security. I very much uh, kind of just landed here by accident. Um, and I did actually find quite a joy. Originally, when I was working on my PhD, I was very much focused on more of the kind of machine learning part and the kind of data visualization and data side of things. It wasn't until I got kind of by accident again, <laughs> ended up going into bug bounties that I really started to find that kind of joy of hacking rather than considering cybersecurity as like a domain I can apply my PhD in. I then started to kind of understand it a bit more holistically. Um, as like a, a full domain. So I started Bug Bounty 2019. I was very fortunate. I was invited to be a mentee at Hacker One event. Um, I just applied and they accepted me. I was like, that's cool. <laughs> um, and when I was there, I'd never done any kind of hacking before at all. Uh, when I was there, I found my first two vulnerabilities ever, got my first bounty. And then I've been kind of doing that ever since. And I found a real joy in, in hacking and um, actually looking at how I can use my data background to kind of inform that and how I can think a bit more about kind of dealing with like large data sets and automation in kind of a different way that I think a lot of other people don't look at. But yeah, that's kind of my, my background. That's very, very interesting. And I think you already uh, talked a little bit about it, uh, but um, you remember what you handed in your first block bounty? Uh, I know you mentioned it was Hacker One, but what do you feel at the moment? What, what exactly was the feeling? Oh, it was pure, pure joy. I, I was shaking. So I found, I found my first bug primarily just because one request was a little bit different from all the other ones. It wasn't even like a major thing. It wasn't like earth chattering. It was just a little bit different. And I thought that's a bit weird. So I started to look more into it and I kept on looking into it. And then I realized, oh my God, 
I can, I can do something here. And when I realized that I was like, oh no, how am I going to get this other like piece of information that I needed? But, okay, it's fine. So then I was like testing this to find even more. And I found my second bug at the same time because I was putting in numbers and because I was just messing around, I was just putting in absurdly large numbers and realized there was no validation on that. So I tried an absurdly large negative number. The unfortunate thing is this was a price variable and therefore I had managed to get something not just for free, um, but negative money, nice. um, which is always great to get paid. Uh, and we were coming up to a really, that was the last few like moments of the event. And I was sitting there writing it up and we had to get it in by the deadline. And I was shaking. I couldn't think. I was panicking and I had my mentor with me. Now my mentor had, like she had significant experience in bug bounties and cybersecurity. And she was freaking out as well. And we were both sitting there getting really freaked out. And we both just couldn't, like we had too much anxiety. We were shaking. Um, and even though she's got like years of experience, even she was struggling. And then we got it in by a deadline. And she's like, right, I need to go have a cigarette just because of how intense those last few minutes were and I was just sitting around with some of the other mentees and someone from Hacker One came over to us and he was like oh Katie how you doing how you doing I've got some good news for you I'm giving you a thousand dollar bounty and I was like oh, no 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 you're not um and yeah it was just pure joy I think I was on cloud nine for ages and I don't think that feeling's ever gone away every single time I find something I still get that kind of adrenaline rush mixed with anxiety mixed with anticipation I don't think that ever goes away yeah that, that's pretty amazing I think uh, the feeling of popping shells and finding uh finding little bugs eh, is just one of those amazing feelings isn't it mm, uh, I, I can't imagine how you felt I mean <laughs> I remember the, the first time I find I found something in a CTF something super simple. I think I was just using Barsoot. And I was super excited. I can't imagine what it is it's like finding a real bug in a real application. So Well, I'd never even done a CTF before. Oh, I really? was like, this this is goes completely like something I'd never experienced. So it was like turned up to 11 to be like, not only is it my first time <laughs> I found a bug, not only is it my first bug, my first time ever hacking and using Burp or using any kind of software, it was also the, the the first bounty I got as well. It's just, oh my God, it was that's an amazing, amazing day. I'll never forget it. Yeah, man, that's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so given that you do, do go after a lot of, uh, well, or you play around with bug bounties and you're very much involved with this kind of thing, is there any relevance of uh, OSINT, so open source intelligence, that's that's relevant in your work as well? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, when we're hacking, we're hacking over the internet. And the amount of stuff you can just get off Google is incredible. There's a type of hacking who, called Google Dorking, which is literally just sending like searches into Google and getting bugs out of it because you find exposed PII or you find, um, tends to be mostly exposed PII, um, or you find like some um, vulnerable web version, for example, a uh, version of something on the web that's being exposed. And then I think with that as well, there's also this kind of impending problem in bug bounties. And it's been kind of a problem for a while, which is that the internet is big. The internet is really big. And a single target like Yahoo is not just yahoo.com. It is, you know, all the local versions of yahoo.com. It is fantasy football. It is a bunch of the apps they make. It's like part of the wider Verizon group. It's got this like, you think about something as being like one web page, but it's this like graph of all these interconnected products and web pages. And you need information from acquisitions to um, things like DNS records, to emails. Some people use things like LinkedIn in order to find out more about their targets. Um, it's not just as simple as here's a website, go and hack it. If you really want to be finding unique bugs that nobody else has found before, you need to dive deep into anything you can find. And of course, they don't let kind of all that information out in the open. You need to work for it. So I think, you know, OSIN is really, and some of the techniques that people who like do OSIN are incredible. 
my favorite ones are when people like post a photo and then people tell you where the photo was taken like how did you even do that like what what is that but in terms of the kind of stuff we deal with it's less where that photo was taken and more oh i see that you know this company has acquired this company what's the history of that company um to looking at kind of like email address records to looking at dns and seeing how the host of some website has changed especially then not just dealing with that then adding the time dimension as well so you've got to look back in time because stuff can get left behind like the amount of data to really find unique bugs osn is critical for understanding yeah that's that's impressive and, and talking about the companies and just uh, how big they are and all their networks uh, i know that a thing that a lot of people struggle with is choosing their targets and i know that you have mentioned this in the past a few times but would you Talk a little bit about that. How did you choose your targets? Well, I think people freak out a lot because they feel like they choose the right target. And I think that a lot of people think that there's some kind of attribute that makes something like the perfect place to start. And that's just not true. And in fact, if you go into something thinking, I can't find a bug here because it's too hard, you probably end up like overlooking things because you are like overthinking it. Um, so good targets for me, especially if you're first getting started, it's about communication actually from the program. So it's not just about having, you know, wide scope, narrow scope apps, um, web applications. It's about having a team that wants to work with you. And there are some teams that, you know, they want to just accept a, uh, accept a uh, bug and then that's it. They just want to have it. They want to have that kind of minimal connection. But actually, you almost like need a bit of a mentorship relationship when you hack a target. So you understand better the impact. And often what I kind of see is like, I want to know why something I found wasn't that impactful so I can better adjust it for when I hack next time. Like it's something you don't necessarily get insight in. And I think as well, it's all about playing your strengths. So for me, what my strengths are is that I have an iPhone. <laughs> Sounds like a, a, a weird strength, but a lot of people don't hack on iOS which means that there's opportunity there for me to get in. Um, not only that, but like, okay, I know that I know a lot about API hacking. So I focus more on APIs because that's what I know. And my strengths won't necessarily be somebody else's strengths. So it's really about choosing what your core strengths are about things like, um, you know, uh, a company that you know really well because you've used their product before. It might be a, um, um, a target where it's had a recent acquisition and there's something new and fresh to hack on. It might be that a good choice is based on the technology that they use or the technology they don't use or because you specialize in Google dorking. So you want, want something which has been indexed by search engines a lot. So there's so many different like attributes that you may as well hack on anything. Because the thinking about it is just wasting your time when you could be out there actually hunting and better understanding the target in front of you. That's that. That's actually really interesting. You mentioned you mentioned something very subtly just before, and then it was just about uh, touching on core strengths, um, but not just about the core strengths of your knowledge, but also met, uh, from a um, uh, let's say um, a motivation standpoint and how perceptive you may be or how uh, adept you may be or how, how, how can you actually get yourself to a point where you're mentally hardened enough or perhaps it's just a, uh, you know, it's a lack of motivation or it's how you build your motivation. What, what was that like for you? Because I think a lot of people getting into hacking right now, they, they want to get into hacking. They want to do things inside of the hacking room. They want to learn things. But I think what a lot of people miss out on is um, the fact that, yes, there is a lot of information out there as well. Uh, what's the process? You know, how do you get yourself mentally into that position? So the thing about motivation and human motivation is that money isn't actually a great motivator. It's a great motivator to a point. And after that, it doesn't become a motivator anymore. Um, and that's because once our sign of basic needs are met, you know, the rent is paid, you can buy food, you kind of can buy things that you want to buy, you can indulge in hobbies, etc. Once you have that, it doesn't actually matter how much extra you pay somebody. 
And one of the kind of reasons I think some people get stuck is because they only think about money as a motivator. And as soon as you have a job, money doesn't like working additional hours to earn more money. If you've got a stable job and you've, you're earning enough, isn't actually a huge motivator for people, like people in general. So what are the kind of three motivators are mastery. So getting better at something. Autonomy, doing it in the way we want to do it. Uh, and purpose, which is doing something which has a greater um, impact to society. So the way to think about um, hacking is within those lenses. It's find why you want to hack. What greater value do you have hacking? So, for example, is it because you want to secure the web internet? Is it because you want to make people more secure? Are you concerned? Is that the good you're doing to society? Is it because you just want to get better at something? You want to just improve your skills and, you know, level up. I mean, CTFs are great for learning, but you go on to a real target and the jump is huge. Like the actual skill gap feels like a less of a gap, more of a chasm. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then you have um, autonomy, which is doing it in your own way. So choosing your targets, hacking what you want to hack getting better and also um, doing it for some greater purpose than just, you know, I want to get paid. So I think what's really important is to shift your motivation away from find bug, get paid to learning more about hacking, learning more about how the internet works, learning how to break the internet, doing it because maybe you think it's good for society to do it. A lot of people are motivated by that. Or for me, a lot of it is about puzzles. I'm the kind of person who gets something, put it on my desk and I will break it. I will put it into parts and be unable to put it back together again. And that's kind of why I like hacking because the, the, um, like the thinking about the puzzling it out, understanding how it was built, it's kind of like a puzzle apart from all the pieces of white. So you have to figure it out just by the shapes. And then for me, getting better at something is a real key uh, motivator. I am quite self-critical, but in a good way, in the sense that I'm always thinking about my skill set and how I can improve and how what skills I need to learn, what skills that I'm doing quite well at, what skills that I want to gain in the future. And I'm always looking for that opportunity to learn, but not just like read a book, but like put that uh, book into practice. So in terms of the motivation, that is, I think, a better way of looking at things than just getting paid for, for doing something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more there. I think um, I think the most of us who are really motiva motivated in this kind of field, we, look, we do like to break things, don't we? <laughs> um, so tell me about your, some of your recent work. Um, what, have, what, have, what have you been doing recently and what really drew you to it, apart from the whole breaking things and putting them back together? Oh, man, I can't talk too much about it. But one of the things that I'm really interested in is APIs. And that's because I, in, as my former job as a developer, I used to write a lot of APIs. And they are some of the most interesting things to break because APIs are not really written for humans. They're written for just computer systems to talk to one another. Like you have a device, you have the internet, you want to talk to them, you use an API. You want to talk between two websites, API. A bunch of it is APIs. It's APIs all the way down. And especially nowadays that we see a lot of the growth in JavaScript, especially for making really interactive UIs, APIs are becoming more and more common. So the question is, with APIs becoming more and more common, with a lot of API specifications, you can just find people describing APIs, how can we leverage that? plus the API top 10 to actually discover API vulnerabilities. So how do we take the vast amount of data that is the entire internet and do kind of internet scale scanning tasks primarily at APIs? Because a lot of kind of conventional scanners don't work on APIs because they're just not designed to. They're designed for um, you know dealing with the kind of 
uh, like visual part of a website and they can find DOM XSS because it has certain properties. But actually APIs are completely different because often it requires directly interacting with a server. How do you test for security vulnerabilities if you're directly in, uh, attacking a web server without causing any kind of ethical or destruction of data? If you want to test for some API vulnerabilities, like can you delete somebody else's resource, that's destructive. So how can we test an API to be non-destructive, but also find vulnerabilities in it? And that's kind of the big problem I'm now working on, is that kind of answer to how do we actually secure APIs and do so really with a low developer um, kind of interaction. So really making sure that we're not putting everything on developers and saying, you should write more secure code. Like magically, they're going to start writing secure code because the security team has yelled at them. Um, but instead recognizing that there is security processes there that have to be followed and finding out ways to automate it to reduce the stress on developers. That's super interesting and actually really relevant. As you mentioned, we are moving more towards uh, using APIs for almost everything, right? So it's pretty, pretty interesting. And um, you also have an incredible, an incredible YouTube channel as well, right? Uh, and it's full of yeah. rich content. I have to say I have watched quite a few of your videos and enjoy them. Um, what motivated you to start creating content? And um, for example, if it was me, what would be your tips for me if I'm starting, if I want to start creating content as well? Well, the starting out, so after I went to my very first Hacker One Live event, I was convinced the two bugs I found were a fluke. And then I think it was maybe a week later. Now I'm based in the UK, Hacker One is based in the US. So I woke up bright and early for work that day and I had an email that said, hey, do you want to go to Vegas during DEF CON and, go and be a mentee at this other event? And I'm like, yes, yes, I would like to go to Def, DEF CON and I'd like to go to Vegas for free. Thank you very much. Um, and at that point, I was convinced that the two bugs I found were a fluke. And when I was there, I found two more bugs. And I was like, well, you know, I know data. I put two and two together. I might be kind of good at this. But really what kind of inspired my YouTube channel was I met some of the other mentees and I realized what they were struggling with and why, not necessarily that I had been successful, but the difference between me as somebody who had been successful and where they were at, and really the difference in knowledge levels, because it wasn't that they were bad. And I don't think it's true that people are just bad at things. And I don't think it's because their mentors were bad either. I just kind of had this interesting insight to what they were struggling with because I had overcome it. So while I was there, I just sat down with them and I went through Burp Suite and I went through every tab and explained how you would use that. And also um, kind of the context in like the security context you'd use it in. So you should use the repeater tab to do this. And here is how Intruder works. And here's what all of the settings do. Because I realized that for them was a big barrier. It's a big sort of people who might be listening might have already seen what Burp looks like. Maybe you haven't. I recommend just, you know, pausing, going and looking at a screenshot of it and then work out if you could figure that out on your own because it's quite challenging. Um, and it's something you really do gain from experience. Once you start to play around with Burp more and more and more, you become quite familiar with it and quite comfortable. But not only were they being put into the deep end of hacking like a real target, which is a big gap between a CTF and a real target, but also being put in front of a new piece of software that they'd never seen before and they had no idea how to use. And I realized that that was a huge barrier for them. So when I got home, I was like, I'm going to make a video doing that. And I made a video that was me going through every tab in Burp and explaining what it did. And I got really good reception from that. And I realized that the gap in knowledge in bug bounties and in cybersecurity, web security more, more generally, isn't the beginners. Because a lot of people can open up a tutorial. It's what happens next. You download Burp, you install Burp, you get it working. And then what? How do you use it? And it's the same with bugs. People tell you there's a bug here. This is the type of bug it is. 
here's the kind of attributes that it has and here's how it works but they don't really explain to you and here's how to find it that part was missing and so I was like I'm going to be the change I wish to see in the world and so I started making videos that kind of answered that question that went through kind of the basics of a bug but didn't just stop there that's like and here's the kind of applications you find it in and here's how you hunt from it and here's a live demo showing you how I look at this and how I would hunt for it and that's really like the motivation was kind of answering that question I was also just a beginner I wasn't like super intelligent with doing it for 30 years I kind of realized I had this insight into what it was like to know nothing at all and then I could look at kind of the other content out there and realize what was missing. In terms of tips, if people want to be a content creator, one of the most important things you can do is find out what that is for you. A lot of people on YouTube will call it finding your niche or your niche if you're American. Um, but it's far more about finding the problem you want to solve. Like, is it that there's no full course on on a vulnerability where people explain it from start to finish and that has lab exercises and what have you is it kind of looking at, at reaching people interested in security but who are looking to kind of have more technical details by figuring that question out it's a hard question to answer that then tells you kind of what your content should be about the other tips i'd give are a lot more kind of procedural Things like understand what you want your video to look like. I was, because of my background in academia and academics, I really wanted to make videos that looked like slideshows and that felt like lectures, that felt like that kind of traditional classroom environment, because that is how I felt was best to present this information, not as like somebody who would go down, you'd go down to the pub with, but instead a teacher teaching you something in a quite a formal way. And getting that style right, I think, is really important because there's a space for everybody in content creation. There's a space for, you know, I watch YouTubers who are just funny people who are mildly amusing and who seem like they'd be great to hang out with. But then I also watch people that I expect more video essay content from, really thoughtful, um, in-depth explanations of issues. So... In addition to that, I don't think you need to have like a good microphone. A lot of people get stuck on, get a good microphone, get a good camera. As long as you're enthusiastic about what you're trying to present, you don't have to be really hyper, really excited all the time and sound like you're not even a real person because no human being can hold up that kind of enthusiasm for more than 30 seconds. Um, it really just means that you've got that kind of in-depth connection with what you're talking about. If that's, I've been doing security for 20 years, here's my perspective and my take on things, that's fantastic. If that's, I've just started out in security, I'm a beginner, here's my take on things, that is exactly the same kind of level of like just interesting to listen to. And I think it's that general enthusiasm that people think you're not just making content because, you know, you want to get rich. I think a lot of people end up cut, stop, stuck in that hole. Um, but instead that you want to educate, inform, or just gives people some interesting facts. Um, and my final tip is don't just think about it. A lot of people get stuck. It's the same as hacking something. A lot of people get stuck on that. Yeah, it'd be really great to make some videos. Yeah, anyway, I'm just going to go play some video games for three hours. Um, you know, if this is something that really interests and excites you, don't just sit on it. Don't just go, that'd be really great if I could do that. Really set, like, look at how you would um, um, put that into practice, whether that is arranging work schedules or, you know, cutting back on the kind of relaxation time to try and put effort into it, whether that's going to kind of the company you work for and saying, I'd love to do engaging content on the internet and this, and here's my business case for it. Um, I think it's really easy to get stuck in it. It'd be really great if I, and then never doing it. That's pure gold. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> an interesting part of that is it, it still comes down to, to discipline, doesn't it? Yeah. I think uh, discipline, is, discipline is something that, that takes you forward, even, even inside of hacking and um, learning and, and finding places to learn, learn new things from. 
myself, I mean, I would have loved to have had had the resources like like your YouTube page when I was starting in was it 2015 or 2016. There's so much really cool content out there, you know. Um, but <clears throat> what are other places that people can look look into for very uh, let's say more refined information in terms of how do we start hacking? What are the tools you need? Is it just burp and and other other tools that you know we know that let let's say I don't want to use the term but the term script kiddies and the people who are just starting in the field you know they they load a Cali they load a Cali box and they have a couple couple tools out there um, where would someone like that go to to find the essentials or go to to find what's really valuable in terms of this is where I should really be starting. Yeah, I mean, first off, you put, brought up something really good, which is discipline. Um, your motivation is limited, like as in it is actually limited. You cannot just use willpower to get through work because it runs out. You get yeah. stressed, you get burnt out. Um, so one thing that I found really useful in, in learning um is to one make sure I have a mix of things that I'm working on right now. I'm reading a um, book on how to write um, CTF exercises, for example. Now I won't just read the book. I'll then go and actually try and follow it and try and develop a CTF exercise, for example. And then I'll try and figure it out and, and like base that based on other vulnerabilities that I found. Now this is what's really important. There is not one like magic box that will teach you everything about hacking it just doesn't exist and if somebody is claiming that they're probably selling you it um and they're trying to get you to spend money on it but there is no like there's no book there's no course there's no degree there is no um magic scroll that is going to teach you everything about hacking you've got to learn it from a lot of different resources that work for you and my kind of like take on this is that you have to kind of make it work for you. However, something that I really like is mixing it up. So I'll do a bit of reading. I'll do a bit of um, CTF practical exercises. I'll do a bit of trying something and I'll kind of mix it all around. So I'm not just like reading and studying constantly. Um, so resources that I really like, um, I think Try Hack Me does a great CTF website, especially if you are a student because their student deal is actually really good. It's really well priced. I think it's very fairly priced. Um, it's not like a lot of things where it's like double or triple the price. Um, and there's a lot you can do for free. So I really like Try Hack Me. I think they do a really great job, especially if you're doing more on the pen tester side rather than web application security. I think it does a really great job. Um, I think there's a ton of stuff on YouTube nowadays. Um, there is securitycreators.video, which is a website that just lists a bunch of security creators. And I'm on that list. But if you don't like my content, you can sure find somebody else who gels better with you. Um, I don't really like courses for a lot of things, but I do recommend if a degree is something that is within your kind of affordability when if you can afford to do a degree a lot of countries they are significantly cheaper than other countries so i realize this is not really an option for everyone but a degree or other recognized professional qualification can be really helpful in giving you a path to follow so there is an end date because often you're just studying and studying and studying and that's it you only study you never have that kind of and i'm done and you never really will be done in your career. You always have can have continued professional development. But having a date to look forward to where you no longer have to study feels really good. And a degree is super useful because you meet so many people. Like a lot of people will talk about getting a mentor and they'll be like, for example, DMing me being like, can you mentor me? It's not really how mentorships happen. I've learned so much from my peers. Like I have listened to their talks. But I've also talked with them and kind of bounced ideas back and forth and seen what they've been working on. And that has really brought my own understanding forward. Like creating a study group, honestly, one of the most powerful tools to learn cybersecurity. Um, I also think there are some really great books out there. 
I am currently reading Practical IoT Hacking, which is a really great introduction to hardware hacking with a bit of web application API stuff. Um, and I think there's a lot in really good developer books as well. Like um, I'm reading one book on microservices and APIs, uh, but not on the hacking side, but on the building side. And that has really helped me to learn. I've actually got an entire video on like all of these resources, but there's just not one thing I can recommend because it's going to be like so dependent on you as an individual. I'd say go on to Twitter, follow some interesting people, like whether or not for you that is people in OSIN or web application hacking or penetration testing or maybe career hacking. You can find them through DEF CON groups is how I like to do it. Follow a bunch of them and see what they recommend because they will show like show off what they're listening to, what they're watching, what they're reading. And that can be really useful to building up a kind of library of recommendations and then get an entire group together, like get your friends. Or if you are maybe, you know, you don't have any friends that are into hacking, join a group online. Um, there is a bounty hunters discord group that I recommend. And just start chatting with people because genuinely meeting new people is so useful for like expanding your learning and really basically stealing what they're doing and what they're reading and taking that for yourself. That's super, super interesting. And going back a little bit to what you mentioned of having like a kind of an end date or an end game, um, what do you think, what are your plans for the future? That's a really good question. <laughs> I have always considered my future as being kind of flexible. I've never been somebody who like um, sees a single like thing and goes, yes, I'm going to do that and I will not deviate from that path. I'm always taking opportunity. And for me, you know, that means I don't necessarily know what the future holds, but I do know what my short term goals are. I know that I want to continue educating people and I want to create more content, but I'd really like to create content which pushes the boundaries. So I really want to create kind of things like hardware hacking, for example, that nobody else is really talking about, or not nobody else is really talking about, but few people are kind of going to have the same take as I would. Um, and as well, looking at ways that, you know, I can introduce new types of hacking to people, like how to get into car hacking, how to get into, um, you know, microservices and Docker and containers. So that's... Um, Kind of one thing. Uh, I know that for me, one of the major things is always going to be to educate people, but I want to work on interesting stuff. I want to work on the kind of things that matter to not just me, but the wider society's big questions about security. Because, you know, I speak to my mom. My mom does not know anything about computers. My mom is scared because she'll hit the start menu button on her keyboard and she'll get a bit scared that the start menu pops up and she's like, ah, I've broken it. My mom doesn't know anything about uh, computers, but when I speak to her, she's obviously quite concerned about security. She doesn't really understand it, but, you know, she says she thinks critically. For example, um, my brother needed her payment details for something um, he was buying for her, I guess. And he was like, OK, just send them to me, just text them to me. And she was like, no, I'm not doing that. That doesn't seem very secure. No, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. And then she kind of had this ingenious idea of, I'm not going to send it on just one platform. I'm going to use like three different places to send. Um, so that way, if you have one piece of information, you don't have all of it. And what I kind of get from that is that my mom knows that security exists. She knows it's a problem. She doesn't really know necessarily how to be more secure. And she also puts a lot of trust in some of the products that she uses, that they are secure. And I think really what motivates me and the reason why I want to continue in security and work on interesting things is because I think about everyone like my mom, who is worried, but maybe doesn't have the kind of flash of genius that my mom had when she was like, I'll just send it in three different places. So then if they get one password, they don't have access to all of it. I still told her she shouldn't have sent her card details, but I had to give her points for in uh, ingenuity for that one. I love that. Sorry, <laughs> it's really good. Really cool. Yeah, amazing. Uh, well, I guess as a final question, 
Um, what do you think are the three most important things that help you? And what's the commonality with what are those three important things that helped you and what would they be as a NOSIN practitioner? What, what are these three things that we should keep in mind every day? Oh, that's a really good question. I'd say, first of all, is keep learning. Never stop learning. Like, never be in a position where, like, I know everything I need to be able to do my job. Because when you keep an open mind about all of the resources, and especially taking um, information from things you wouldn't necessarily expect. Uh, for example, I often think of a book called So You've Been Publicly Shamed by John Ronson. And it's a book all about public shaming online. And it's something that I keep thinking back to throughout my processes, like the, his kind of take on things that I don't think I would have considered normally. I think about kind of when, when I'm not going to go too much into the book. It's a great book, though. When he talks about things like how people react to being publicly shamed and the reactions and how, what that says about the psychology of somebody, I find that really interesting. And it often makes me kind of take a step back and think not just about the technological aspects of like being online, but also the people as well, because a bug isn't necessarily about just the code or just the API endpoint or just the computer. Often it's about people because something can functionally be working as intended, but still be insecure because of what people can do with it and what information is available. So get inspiration from everywhere. Um, always be learning. Always be open-minded. Um, always be, you know, watching what your peers are doing and taking that learning from them when they share it. Um, the second one is, I think, don't make assumptions about things. Don't assume you know what's going on, especially if you've got a background in being a developer like I do. Often I assume how code is supposed to work because that's how I write it. But then I make the assumption and I'm completely wrong and it's still vulnerable. I think, you know, any human is liable to kind of make assumptions about the way the world works. But I think if you kind of take, take that step back and don't make the um, the assumption, I think that's useful for everybody, um, especially in security where we're dealing with that kind of combination between people, computers and processes. And I think the most important thing which has really helped me is build up that network, um, meet people. I know we're all socially awkward. It's okay. We all feel terrible. Um, like every one of us hates talking to other people, but it's so important to like um, um, understanding uh, the um, like wider, like outside of ourselves, meeting people, making connections, putting yourselves out there is like key to uh, success, I think. It's not just about you and your kind of local community. It's about groups online. And if you're shy, don't worry, everybody else is too. So just like tell people, hey, I'm super awkward. I'm sorry. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Um, or just, yeah, just put in hi in a chat message and go away for 10 minutes and then join a conversation randomly. They won't even notice. <laughs> Surprisingly works though, doesn't it? I think uh, we can all account, uh, all let's say, attest to some of that. Um, and I guess there we have it. Uh, that was that was some really cool information there that you've shared with us today, Katie. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we do appreciate you hopping on the show with us. Um, yeah. And we look forward to maybe seeing you again sometime. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you very much for having me, both of you. It's been yeah, it was really a interesting chat. real, real honor. Yeah. Thank you so much, Katie. All right. And I guess that concludes the show for today. Uh, listen, Katie, personal note, thank you very much. Um, very, very cool to have you here. And it, it's, it's an honor, honestly. Yeah. So I, I wish you all the best. And um, you know where to reach us if you need us anytime. <laughs> no, thank you very much. It's really great. been great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Brad. Right. See you. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye.